and I end up in a hole in Argentina. I'm in jail for three days and in a hole in an isolation cell with no food and a dirty cell and the same clothing and freezing cold and I get down on my knees and I go, Jesus, I, I need you. I, I've tried it all. I mean, I've, I've done it. I've, 21 countries, scuba diving, skydiving. I've had the pleasure of getting to know a few beautiful women. Uh, I've partied in VIP in a few places. I've been to the nicest nightclubs and I've also uh, talked to some really cool people in like the poorest parts of town in some places. If you cooked a Thanksgiving dinner and it was everything you've ever wanted, but there was no salt, you're not gonna enjoy it. Like why would you even waste the time? That is the world without Jesus. Now when you have Jesus, oh my goodness, every little thing is amazing. We're trying to define love without the definition of love. So God, defi he's not defined by anything, he but he defines everything. So how can we love? I see a lot of people trying to start relationships without God's love. How do you do that? The most common thing for non-believers is not, I hate God. It's God hates me. That's very difficult. They feel hated by God for the way that God's people treat, him, or treat them. So we have the beggars and the crippled and the lame coming into the Last Supper, and you guys are getting kicked out because I am trying desperately to explain to them that they're okay the way they are. I don't care if you're gay. I don't care if you had an abortion. I don't care how you identify as gender. I don't care what race you are. We're all human. Just come inside and eat. And here you are wasting so much time talking about why the rainbow flag ticks you off. Loving Christ and then finding pleasure and sharing that love of Christ. That's like, that's cloud nine. That's the best. Well, thank you for talking to us today, Brandon. Um, first question, how did you meet God? At what age? I think it was always a journey. Um, when I was 15, I got down on my knees in a church and I said, I really want to know who you are, God. I want to know who you are, not who people say you are, not what I think the Bible says you are. I want to know you. I don't know if you're Jesus. I don't know if you're, you know, Buddha. I just want to know you. And I believe that if you are all powerful and you own this universe, then you will show me that. I believe if you're really God and you're really interested in getting to know me, then you'll be, you'd be willing to do that. And so this process started through many years of getting to know our creator. And I learned that this guy, yeah, he's all powerful. And yes, Jesus is God, but he's also relatable. Jesus would have been hanging out with us at the pool hall or the bar or the theme parks. You know, Jesus would have been at the beach with us. And he might have been at church to correct the leadership there. But for the most part, the guy would have been hanging out with us. He's this very human, very relatable, very cool God uh, who, you know, he's a source of this this joy, he's a source of happiness, you know. So it's really been a very long journey of asking him questions and saying, all right, now I believe, now I believe that you're God. I believe that Jesus is God. I know I'm not, but who are you? You know, like, what was your favorite food? You know, like, um, what kind of bugs did you like and not like, you know, did, did you like and not like bugs? You know, did you like and not like a certain bird? Who's your favorite person, God, really? Because I think we have this idea that he's so far away from us. And yes, he is, he is way more powerful than us. And he exists in eternity. And we exist in this infinity of the universe, which is kind of a joke compared to God. But he also came in the flesh, so he's relatable, you know. He might have had a favorite type of wine or, you know, a favorite beach. Or, I don't know what's going on over there in that part of the world, especially back then. But, mm. you know, so learning that God is, is, is a friend and a father that was really a, like a breakthrough. It's God might have had a favorite person, you know? <laughs> Did he reveal to you? No, 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 I don't. <laughs> it's me, no, I'm just kidding. No, I don't, I don't know, honestly. For sure, I, I know yes. he had. I know he probably had a favorite disciple yeah. um, as a man, you know, mm -hmm. as, as the father, we're all equal, but yeah. as a man, 
you know, he has to experience everything we have to experience. Yeah. So he probably maybe did Maybe John have, or I maybe think, Peter so is one a, or the other. Right, he had a best friend, I, but, <laughs> but there, were, there were, you know, there were women that he liked yes. more than other women. There yes. were, you know, if there were dogs running around, he would have had his favorite street dog, you know? <laughs> so he had preferences and he had opinions. Mm. Who his best friend was, I don't know. I think the Bible tells us that, but, <laughs> but you know, any any other like uh, you no know, personal information about his life? No, no, I don't, yeah. I don't know. So at the age of fifteen, you you asked the Lord, and how long after did you fully experience Jesus and fully surrender to Him? Oh man. Um, so when I was eighteen, I was falsely accused of a crime, and. I went to the church, and I felt guilt from the church, and so I fell away. I felt rejected by the church um, for the nature of what I was accused of. I felt that it was a punishment for something that I had done, and uh, you know, I couldn't get away from God. I could very easily say that the church is a joke. I could very easily say there's no Jesus in church. I could very easily say that I don't get along with these people but it was impossible for me to get away from Jesus. So I, I continued to try to go to different churches, and I just kept experiencing more judgment and not very much of Jesus' love. And I had experienced when I was younger what I thought was mental illness at the time. Um, you know, I remember somebody in a church going, I don't like this guy, he asked too many questions. And then I learned later that the Bible tells us a fool accepts everything, but a wise man considers much. Um, and so there was this, this period of just like, I really don't like your people, God. And then the devil used that to say, I really don't like you, God. And then fast forward to, to you know, 21 countries of travel and getting to know a lot of people and some of the most godly people I've met don't believe in Jesus. And I end up in a hole in Argentina. I'm in jail for three days and in a hole in an isolation cell with no food and a dirty cell and the same clothing and freezing cold. And I get down on my knees and I go, Jesus, I, I need you. Like, I need help. I've always known it's you, but I need help. And 12 hours later, I was out, and it was hard getting out. My passport got stolen by the police in Buenos Aires, and I had to go to the embassy, and they were trying to mislead me into not being able to leave, and I'm like, what is going on? And that's when I realized I was called to something higher. So even leaving the country, um, it, was, it would have been easier to lie to leave the country. Yeah, I got my PCR test. This was during COVID. Mm. Yeah, I did all this. It would have been easier to lie. But God told me, you're not going to lie. You're going to tell the truth, and I'm going to make a way out for you. And so I was called uh, to tell the truth about, about people and about God and who he is and his love. And when I got back to Orlando, um, things were really difficult, you know. And I was tested and, and tried and judged by a lot of processes. But the more that I go through these things, the easier it gets. And I realize that on the other side of, of these trials and these, these tests, you know, there's nothing that compares to a relationship with God. I, I've tried it all. I mean, I've, I've done it. I've, 21 countries, scuba diving, skydiving. I've had the pleasure of getting to know a few beautiful women. Uh, I've partied in VIP in a few places. I've been to the nicest nightclubs. And I've also... Uh, talked to some really cool people in like the poorest parts of town in some places, you know, and uh, I've talked to Romanian gypsies in Paris and I can continue to line up all of these things and tell you, and this sounds like I'm bragging, you know, but at the end of the day, it's going to end up like Paul. I'm poor, I'm rich, mm -hmm. I just need Jesus, mm -hmm. you know. And so I think for the past two or three years, I've really gotten to know him and who he is in the tiniest little way that I can, given his, his eternal nature. Um, and that's really been the most joy. And I understand now why Paul says, even in my suffering, even as intense as it could be, I'm content. Because at the, you know, God, Satan's going to tempt you. Satan's mm. going to say, well, you can have an easy life or you can have Jesus. And every time if you choose Jesus, I guarantee you the fame and the fortune and all of those things will be added unto you because they're not the devils to give to you. Mm. They're God's. So if you seek first the kingdom of God, you will find that all of those things are added to you. Now, you might have to be a little patient. God knows when you're ready for those things, you know. But the other way, the 27 club, the, the, seeking, the seeking the things of the world, you can have a billion dollars, and that will leave you empty. You, know, you talk, There's a Lecrae song. 
there's a Lecrae song called uh, Confessions, mm -hmm. with two, the S's are dollar signs. Mm -hmm. And it's true, some of the most miserable people I've ever met, they have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But the coolest people are like the people who are just barely making it. Mm -hmm. I mean like the people who are homeless. Yeah. You know, people who are enjoying their life, drinking a soda, you know. And so this is what I learned through this process is God is relatable. He loves us very much. Uh, judgment, stop talking about it. You know, it's a divisive issue. Just love people and uh, get to know him. And if you really seek him, everything you've ever wanted exceedingly and abundantly above will be added to you. So amazing. As you were sharing, I was just seeing how much grace of the Lord of God is giving to his children. His grace, there's no measure. He allowed you, what happened to you, you got rejected from the church at early age, and so you just decided just, you know, and the Lord allowed that to happen. So you travel over 21 countries. God allowed that to happen for you to experience the world. And at the end, for you to know that no pleasure of the world, nothing can fill the emptiness in your heart except Jesus. Nope, you cannot enjoy it. It's like if you cooked a Thanksgiving dinner, and it was everything you've ever wanted, but there was no salt. You're not going to enjoy it. Like, why would you even waste the time? That is the world without Jesus. Now, when you have Jesus, oh my goodness, every little thing is amazing. You know, I woke up today. Look at the sunset. Look at the sunrise. Those things make you happy. So imagine how much happier you're going to be when you have money, how much more uh, comfort you're going to have. Mm -hmm. But if you don't start off at the beginning with this foundation of I'm not God, that guy's God, he's in control, but he does love me where I am. I don't need to be perfect, I just wanna know who he is. When you start off with that foundation, every day's your birthday. You know, that's really where you wanna be. You really wanna be where you're seeking after God and then noticing all these things just naturally through the power of the Holy Spirit dropping into your life. What do you see that in today's society um, I'm speaking in the, uh, the, the Christian community. What are we lacking? Oh, man. The, so the devil wants to divide us. If he can divide us, you know, how it's divided against itself will not stand. The biggest issue I see is one of having meaningless debates. If we do not agree as the body of Christ. Remember, the, the institution of the church, that's a building. The church is the body of Christ. So step one, everyone in your congregation needs to, have, needs to speak the words, Jesus is God. Because I'm going to give you this shortcut. That's something that someone who is not compelled by the Holy Spirit can't say. Yeah. You can only say Jesus is God if you're compelled by the Holy Spirit. Amen. And it may freak you out a little bit because people you think would or your friends who would say it very easily, they're going to go, why do you want me to say that? You can get them to say anything else. You can get them to say the sky is red, but you will not be able to get them to say that if they're not truly saved. So number one is Jesus is God, bottom line. Number two is I am not. I'm not in control. And then we can start talking about the doctrine. We can start talking about all that. Here's real religion. Feed widows and orphans. Take care of them. Know that Jesus is God. Love Jesus as God and serve others. It's to love others as yourself. Can we do those things at a church? Can we meet up on Sundays? That's great, but are you also meeting up with people on Tuesdays and Wednesdays to have coffee? Are you reaching out to people? I'm not saying go give out a bunch of money. Sometimes you should give out food, yeah. but are you showing with your actions every day why it's so cool to know Christ? You know, are you feeding people with your light just by being there? Once we can get on those points, once, once we can get on Jesus is God, once we can get on I'm not, once we can get on uh, take care of widows and orphans, and once we can get on uh, love others as yourself, yeah. then we can start talking genuinely about uh, you know, the LGBTQ debate and, and abortion and all that stuff and race. Like Those are the three main hot button issues these days. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to speak on those things. Am I qualified to judge those things? I don't think so. I haven't been judged by the process of abortion. You know, how, how am I supposed to judge a woman and her stance on abortion when I'm never going to be a pregnant woman? I don't have the authority in Christ, and I probably never will. 
Now, my queen might, my future queen might, but I don't have the authority to judge that. And if I'm judging that, Matthew 7, 1 tells us, judge not lest you be judged. So it's very likely that I'm going to be judged by that process. And it's going to be uncomfortable. So if I go, hey, you know, you shouldn't be gay. Okay, that's cool that you're judging someone like that. Are you ready to have gay urges? Are you ready to feel what it might be like to be tempted to be gay? Yeah. Because if not, then keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Just love the person. Yeah. Have you tried talking to them about like their hobbies first? Have you tried winning them over as a friend before you Jesus beat them, before you Bible beat them? You know, we look at Jesus, he was like, he was angry at the religious leaders who were spouting judgment. But the lady who was committing adultery, he never said, don't commit adultery, you're a bad person. He didn't even mention the word adultery to her. They did. They said she was, the Pharisees and Sadducees said, she's been caught in adultery. The word adultery never came out of Jesus' lips. He said, Do they, is there anyone left? No, no one wants to kill you because they know I'm right. Okay, cool. Then uh, just don't sin anymore yeah. and, and, you know, go. Have a good life. So we spend all this time trying to Bible beat people who aren't even believers. Yeah. And it's like, just taste and see that the Lord is good. Like, yeah. he would have been cool. He would have been a friend. He, he would have been the sober driver. He would have been like the designated driver. He's like, listen. I really don't want you to get drunk. It's a bad idea. Yeah. I know you're going to do it anyway, so I've made a provision. I'm going to drive. All right? I don't want you to do it. Please don't. Please don't get drunk. Yeah. But I know you're going to do it anyway. You're an idiot, so I'm going to be the friend that drives you home. That's Jesus. Oh, Jesus is not the guy standing on the street, street corner yelling, you heathens. Right. That is the Pharisees <laughs> and the Sadducees of this day. Yeah. So this is very long, but my point is we are, as a church, going to be judged first. Mm -hmm. This is extremely vital. If we do not stand up to that judgment, we will not retain that authority in Christ. Mm -hmm. We cannot judge other people when we have not passed those judgments ourselves mm -hmm. and expect not to be judged. Mm -hmm. And anytime we speak as if it is God's word, expect to be judged by those processes. Yeah. Otherwise, if you don't want that level of authority or if you don't think you can handle that judgment, my suggestion is is just to enjoy the experience, to enjoy life. Yeah. Because this is a real spiritual battle. You yeah. know, you've got a spiritual world that, that we don't really see. And the United States has convinced us that there's no spirituality. But this mm. is a spiritual battle. This is life and death. Yeah. So if you're not willing, you know, if you want to step up to the plate, if you want more authority in Christ, that's mm. great. But ask to be judged by those processes first. Ask, hey God, I don't really understand what it's like to be a gay man. You know, help me to be more understanding of them. That way you get judged by God's processes and not by the devil's. Yeah. You know, or, hey, God, I really, I really don't understand abortion. It seems like a huge sin to me. It feels like murder to a baby. Yeah. You know, can you help me to understand that? Can you grant me wisdom and faith? Mm -hmm. And then wait. And I guarantee you, if you've been judged by that process, you're not going to want to judge other people but you are going to know how to approach them for Christ. And 99 times out of 100 is probably not going to be even talking about abortion. Yeah. It's going to be finding a common hobby and sharing your light. Um, so I'm just, I'm really, really frustrated with how much hatred has flowed from the church. Mm. And I'm really excited to see us move into a version of the future where all we do is love, where the church becomes, the, the building of the church becomes a social club. Yeah. You know, if somebody's hope, hope, uh, hopeless on a, on Saturday morning or Sunday morning at 2 a.m. or 3 a.m., they're leaving the club drunk, and their friends just left them, mm. and they're like, I didn't find love tonight. What did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, was the church open? No. No. Church is closed. Wednesday, you know, after work, church is closed. Church is closed. Church is closed. Church is closed. Jesus is 24-7, but the church is closed. So let's create a social club. Yeah. There's no memberships in the church. Just mm. show up as you are, hang out. We don't need a pastor necessarily. Sometimes we do. It's great on Sundays to have some structure, but just hang out. You know, we have all this real estate and there's homeless people. You think they care if they sleep on your floor? You know, set a maximum if you're worried about crowd control. If every church in Orlando, Orlando, my city, set like beds out for three people, everyone would have a place to sleep. Yeah. It's like, well, why are there more drug addicts? Why are there more homeless people? Because they're not sleeping. Mm. They're coming down from these addictions, and they're trying to do their best. And then we are taking away, as believers, our places to sleep. There's a church down here, and where we are we're in downtown Orlando, it has a, a one bench, one. And that bench, very ironically, has 
a statue of Jesus laying down on the bench. And I just think how disrespectful and hateful you can be to the God of the universe to not let his people, because Jesus would have given that place up yes. for somebody. So there's a, there's a lot, you know. Um, but I just, I hope that we move into a place where the church becomes a place to heal and not a place to be hurt. I mean, you went through that. And so I heard so many other brothers and sisters what happened to them, they got hurt by the church too. And it's interesting because it is at the end, Jesus said the two greatest commandments is to love God with all of your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. But it's, uh, you know, something the Lord revealed to me recently is that if we don't have his love in our hearts, if we don't love him, then we can't receive his love. If we don't receive his love in us, then we can't love our neighbor. So it doesn't matter what we preach or what we say, but if his love, his agape love is not in us, how can we really love other people? Right. There's no way. We're trying to define love without the definition of love. So God, defi he's not defined by anything. He is love. But he defines everything. So yeah. how can we love? I see a lot of people trying to start relationships without God's love. How do you do that? How do you, how do you love someone else when you don't, when you don't understand enough of how God loves us? So really loving yourself and then loving others, it's get to know God, have God love you and then love yourself and then love others. We're kind of trying to jump the gun, you know, but yeah, uh, Corinthians, first Corinthians 13, one, it's all about love. Yeah, it's all about love. The whole chapter 13. Yeah. The whole chapter, th yeah. And you know, it's basically, I can talk a lot. It's like I'm doing now. I can talk all day long. Yeah. But you have to decide, you know, do I have love? Am I doing this out of love? You know, this is the Holy Spirit loving through me. That's great. Then my work is useful and it'll stand up in the fire. But if I'm just running my mouth, it'll be burned up in the fire. Now my salvation is secure, but, you know, I'm just wasting my time. Just a resounding gong. Mm -hmm. I, I've encountered a couple of um, questions among the believer asked me, um, do you think um, a saying that once saved, you always save? What do you think, brother? <laughs> oh, man. Um, I, I think that we, sometimes we lack the wisdom to understand that. So God's up here in eternity. Right? We're here in infinity. Infinity seems pretty big. It's the universe expanding and contracting at the same time. Quarks and molecules and atoms and all this stuff. And oh, my goodness, we can't even get to Alpha Centauri, which is only 4.5 light years away. <laughs> So this is where we are, right? Just on earth. And God's in eternity. Yeah. So he's already seen all of time. So you, you are saved, right? If you were or you are or you will be, the, like, I'm going to imagine the earth or the universe as a, as a simulation, you know, just, just for the conspiracy theorists. So like there's this programming condition. It's like A is or something like always is because it is, was, and will be. It's like is, 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 or something like that. You is saved. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you is. You is saved. God knows. Like God is in eternity going, well, you weren't, but you are, so you will be. But you are. To him, seeing all of time, you are. And we're going to very quickly lack the language to express the majesty of God when you try to communicate about time. But that's what it is. He saw us. So, you know, the, the whole Calvinist debate versus the Lutherans, it's, it's a distraction from the devil, right? God knows if you're saved or not, if you were, is, or will be. So, yes, no matter what, you is saved. Just the, the, the walk on this earth is more, more challenging for some people because they don't truly have that relationship with Jesus. Right. So it's all about relationship with Jesus and the intimacy, get to know him. Right. At the end of the day, it, it's when you can first confess that Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord. It's Lord of Lord, King of Kings. It's yes. God. Amen. Just to be clear. So Jesus is God. And I'm convinced that he died on the cross yes. and then he rose on the third day for my sins, that God himself suffered. Yes. Everything else will fall into place. But the reason it's so important, the reason that the church has to agree that Jesus is necessarily God, the Council of Nicaea, the reason that is so important is because God himself chose to suffer for us, experiencing life as a human. Now, he's eternal, 
and we're dumb monkeys. Like we're 300 million years or something like that out of being basically dumber than bonobos. And he chose Thinking to live we're this smart. life. <laughs> we think we're smart, right? We're not. Trying to build the Tower of Babel. Yeah, to right. Reach the Everybody knows the Tower of Babel was a library, right? <laughs> so, so we 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 try to 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 distract from from the fact that Jesus is God, because if the devil can distract you from the fact that Jesus is God, if he can get you to talk about, well, are you saved? Once saved, always saved. What does it matter? Are you saved? Talk about yourself. You know, um, if I'm saved, I know. So if he can get us to distract from that, talk about salvation, and then loop around back to all this stuff, and then it's, well, Jesus really isn't God, is he? <laughs> you know, how much are you willing to compromise on, said the devil. So all of these debates are to distract us from the fact that Jesus is necessarily God. God chose to suffer for us. He could have pulled himself off that cross so quickly. Yeah. But he chose to suffer for us yeah. in a hell that we never have to experience, a hell that is so torturous yeah. that it tortured God himself. Yes. So he chose to go through that so that we don't have to. Yes. And that is being in the absence from the presence of God. That's when, what it when is. When we it's, are not in his presence, you know, hell is in lie. darkness, away so, from the presence of, of God. He is light and absolutely. he is love. If, if God is the truth, everything that is not God is a lie. The, the, you know, Satan is the, the, I hate this term because he doesn't deserve it, but prince of liars. Yeah. So hell is lies. Yeah. It's like the upside down, man. Yeah. Hell is, is not just absence from God. That's what it is. But it's everything that God is not. It's all a lie. So hell will become your, your, it's lies. Like imagine, I mean, I don't even mean a lie about everything. So Light, right? How do you lie about light? It's not just dark. It's like a void. Mm -hmm. and light is a particle in a wave, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's the opposite of a particle in a wave. Like when I say upside down, I mean in every possible way in eternity, not just in this universe, mm -hmm. hell would be a lie. Mm -hmm. So imagine a God who is so full of truth, not just full of truth now. He is truth. He defines mm -hmm. truth. He's not even defined by truth. He is but truth. But he defines truth itself. Yeah. To say that God is truth is insufficient. Mm -hmm. But to say that he defines truth is okay. So he defines truth and he threw himself. He allowed us to murder him as a human, mm -hmm. the weakest he could possibly be. And he is thrown into a hell of the devil's lies. He is tortured by their lying mm -hmm. and all of the other stuff that is not him. You've got him in hell and everything that is opposed to him. He literally suffered in every infinite and every eternal way for us. Mm -hmm. And to deny that, that's the only sin. Mm -hmm. That, is the, that is the blasphemy. That is the sin that leads to death. That is the way to grieve the Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's what it is. It's the idea that there could be anything that is God other than Jesus. Mm. It's so interesting. As you were sharing, I, I just, there's just this one brother that we filmed last the end last year and he had COVID and he was in the hospital because you're talking about Jesus and this is how beautiful and how loving Jesus is. So the brother's name is Alec and he saw his body. So basically he, he died. Mm -hmm. And so he saw the light came and he was, he knew that's Jesus. And Jesus asked him, so very humanly, so. <laughs> Do you want to stay here or do you want to go mm -hmm. with me? So Jesus gave him the choice mm -hmm. whether he want to stay, come back to spend time, be with his wife or right. go with the Lord. Yeah. But just how Alec share, you know, like you, share, like you said earlier, Jesus was on this earth for over 33 years in this bodily human form. So yes, he has, he's fully human. He's fully God. Mm -hmm. So when he talked to his children, to us, in a very intimate and practical, he didn't condemn Alex. said, well, you didn't do this. In a loving way, he said, so, he, yep. what do you want to do, right? Do you want to stay yeah. or do you want to go? So like, we, Lord, we, you're so awesome. We have this assumption that Revelation is like all at once. Revelation is a guide to the cycles that we see. Yeah. God created this universe just for us. There are no aliens, by the way. 
except for in 1 Peter 2.11. So God has created this entire universe for us. It's a big sandbox. Imagine it as a video game. Once you have Jesus, you can't lose. It's very conceivable that he goes, hey, when you're ready, you can come home, but also I created this for you, so if you want some more time to enjoy it, go ahead. Because now that he's saved you, he, he, he's not on the clock anymore. He can wait on you, yeah. you know. And like I said, we're just dumb monkeys, so maybe we want to spend some time exploring. Maybe we do get to go to Mars. Maybe Venus does become a gas station. Maybe we do wormholes. Maybe we do faster than light travel. And then maybe we're like, all right, we've been on in this you know, universe for 20,000 years now. It's the year 20,010, and I just want to go home. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, we have this assumption that, like, that he wouldn't create an entire universe for us, but he did. Yeah. This is all for us to enjoy. It's the glory of God to conceal the matter and the glory of kings to reveal it. So sometimes when you hear a near-death experience, mm -hmm. Jesus literally gives them the option. He mm -hmm. goes... Do you want to explore some more? Like it's like a, a you know, like a, like a video game almost. Continue or give up. You mm -hmm. give up, you go to heaven. Mm -hmm. When you continue, you can continue here. So mm -hmm. One of the reasons Paul said to live is Christ and to die is gain. Mm -hmm. We can't lose as believers. It's a gain gain for us. Right? It's a it's a win 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 win. Yeah. God's all there for us. We can't lose. Absent from God the body is, is to be present with the Lord. It's like that. Absolutely. So fast. Right. And there's no sin in living. Obviously, it's great mm -hmm. to live. You get to enjoy things. And we don't have the wisdom to understand eternity, obviously. No. So we don't know how good it's going to be there. I'm sure if we did, we'd just all teleport immediately, right? right? I don't want to be here, Lord. Right. I do want to be with you. All right, God, I'm going yeah. home. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> right? Even if you were on your best day, you'd probably yeah. be like, all right, God, I'm going home. Yeah. But for now, we have a giant theme park called Earth. Hmm. With your what you went through in the previous years and the Lord now take you to a different journey. I don't want to use the word realm. So you in a different, like it's a learning process for you. So you, you mentioned earlier a higher calling. Can you talk a little bit about that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so I'm a man that was spoken about. My name is El Hombre Gris, a uh, man who comes from the north, the United States, falls in love with Argentina. And my job is to understand more of the energetic. Um, so I bridge the gap between people. Uh, and one of the ways I do that is I have a very deep understanding of witchcraft, voodoo, santeria, and brujeria. Those are all very bad things. They're the misappropriation of power from God to the devil. Um, but, but I understand those things. And in order to be able to judge those things, I was affected by those things. I don't want to get into too much detail now. Um, you know, I, never, I, I never pledged allegiance to the devil. I never agreed to, to any of that. But if you don't agree to any of that, and you're called to that, God will allow you to suffer that. Mm -hmm. So I've experienced what, uh, what, what that can feel like, and they're very real things. And so part of my experience is sometimes I'll just show up to a place and not know why I'm there, and there will be someone who practices you know, like some serious stuff, and mm -hmm. my job will be to try to win them over for Christ. Um, and sometimes understanding that these powers are real, and mm -hmm. that the devil's threat is, I'll take those away from you, yeah, temporarily, but it's not your power, Satan. You know, it's, it's God's. Amen. So they get to keep like, purified versions of that, you know. I'll give you an example. If I'm really in tune with my intuition, if I'm really good at mind reading, well, that's a consent issue. Mm. But if I'm trying to win you over for Christ and there are certain things I can read off of you and certain things that I'm not privy to because, thank God, I don't want to read all your yeah. thoughts, right? Um, that can help me to win you over for Christ, mm -hmm. guided by the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Um, so there are, there are uses, positive uses to this power, mm. but I have to understand it's not my power. It's not someone's power to hand, hand me other than God's. And I must be judged by those processes. Mm. Power is authority, is responsibility, is privilege. So I must pass these tests in order to be able to use this power. Because mm. like Jesus said, in the last days, they'll start becoming like angels. Doesn't mm. mean we will be angels. We're still human. Um, but angels aren't subject to time. So that's their level. Mm. You know, that's not, God, that's not God level. God's mm. level even. That's angel's level. Mm. So if you want to supposedly have all this power to influence people and do all of these things, uh, you know, and you're practicing the, this witchcraft thing, understand that you're going to be judged by, you know, by the devil's version of that. This isn't the God training program for authority. You're mm. going to be thrown to the devil, mm. and you're going to have to sort that out with him. And mm. if you're lucky, you will survive with nothing but your life. Mm. Um, 
Yeah, so part of my job is, is to really understand the spiritual world. It's a, it's a spiritual battle every day, uh, including the original peoples. For example, the Navajo and the Jerobo people of, of um, Kissimmee. I can, I can access their spirits. Now, I'm not allowed to call the dead, but there's a difference between calling a spirit and calling a, a soul. Like Saul, when he called he was, Samuel, he called right. the dead. The dead. He was literally calling the soul of Samuel. Right. If you understand, like if you, if you have a, an uncle who dies and you go, now what would my uncle Rick have done? You're calling his spirit. Mm -hmm. You're calling a memory of him. Now if you go, if you hold a seance and call your uncle Rick, that is a sin. Mm -hmm. That's what, that was, that was really Saul's sin. Mm -hmm. um, I think he called Samson, right? No, Samuel. Samuel. Um, so the spirits of the Navajo and, and the Jerobo have sent me envoys. Now, this takes a lot of wisdom to understand, but imagine there are some Navajo people staying in a hotel that you're staying at. And while they're speaking with you, you can tell which spirits are influencing them. Some are godly and some are ungodly. Some are clean and some are unclean. And these spirits might represent living people who have current energetic authority. And so you've got to negotiate with these people. And then the same thing as, as Argentina. You've got the Mapache people and the Toba people. And these are people who have real desires. And those spirits, you know, they have no soul. Those souls have mm -hmm. gone home. But those spirits desire things for their ancestors, for their children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren. So it's a matter of energetic negotiation because these are levels of authority that these people have, especially with believers. You know, if you have, if you have other believers, you have to negotiate with them. And if you have unbelievers, we still try to negotiate with those, those spirits. But at the end of the day, God's going to pull rank. So mm -hmm. they might create a delay, and God is patient, desiring that all should come to repentance and none should perish. Mm -hmm. um, but so seeing all of these things is what makes me el hombre gris. It means the gray man, the middle ground, more or less. Mm. Um, so, and when did the Lord uh, yeah, put you so, in that position? Like, how so long ago was that? Down in Argentina a couple of years ago, about mm. three years ago, I realized that, that witchcraft was real. Mm. I was in Cordoba which is a beautiful city, by the way. And you've got like white witches and you've got witches who do what's called black magic. But really, if you don't have same. Jesus, right, then it, exactly, still, it's the same. It's the same. It's, it's just a deception and lies from exactly, the devil. Exactly. And what yeah. you'll notice is a slide from people doing white magic to doing dark magic. So without Christ, it's just a joke. Yeah. Um, and so that's when I realized that I had always had a sixth sense and I was diagnosed as bipolar. Mm -hmm. um, swinging between opposites until I settle on a middle ground. So very el mm. <laughs> But But uh, in Christ, you're not bipolar. No, no, no. I, no, I don't. Yeah. No, definitely not. I'm definitely, um, definitely gifted. Yeah. So seeing all of this helps. But I'll give you an example as to why witchcraft is, is so dangerous on a practical level. Mm. Obviously, it's dangerous because you're stealing from, from God. But on a practical level, imagine that I read your mind. Mm. Okay. I might, uh, so I'm not going to start out reading your mind, reading your conscious thoughts. Our conscious thoughts are very limited. Yeah. What if I'm reading your subconscious thoughts or your emotional state, and mm. I'm not familiar with that? What if you feel sad or depressed? Mm. What if you're suicidal? Mm. I'm going to feel that. I'm going to empathize with that while I'm reading your subconscious and your conscious. Now, I've already got my conscious, my subconscious, and my emotions, and my physical sensations. So without God, it's dangerous. Mm -hmm. You can go crazy. In fact, you do eventually. That's mm -hmm. insanity. You know, they call it loco. Mm -hmm. Loco in, in, in my, my adopted culture yeah. is somebody played around with magic and they don't know Jesus. But once you know Jesus, you realize it's gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And we use it to win people over to Christ. And sometimes we get cool benefits. It's easier for me to train dogs. You know, that's a gift from God. Is it necessary to win people over to Christ? No, but it's a cool, <laughs> it makes life easier. It's a little shortcut, you know. Only if the Lord allows right. that if, to happen. If Lord willing, he and if I'm still alive. Allow that. Yeah. Right. So it's very important. It's very important that, that people understand that I might use the word magic, and that's to be agreeable. It's to so that I can reach out to these cultures who still believe in in this form of of of, of power. Because some of these people are unreached for Christ. They have mm -hmm. never heard of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So going in there and going, magic doesn't exist and Jesus is real. It's the worst way to win yeah. people to Christ. If you go, yes, I understand you have energetic gifts and you don't talk about them because people want to take them from you and you're worried they might weaponize them and also Jesus is pretty cool, that's probably the way to do it. Yeah. But in reality, at the end of the day, semantics and diction aside, it's gifts of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is a gift for serving Christ and to win people to Christ.
Yeah. And sometimes we get cool stuff. Like sometimes we, it's easier in the gym. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's easier to train a dog. Yeah. You know, sometimes people treat us with favor because they see our light. But that's just a, a benefit of the job that we do, which is 24/7 serving Jesus Christ. Oh, man. I mean, as you were sharing, there's like a couple of scriptures in yeah, you know, just in my mind, like. First, seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything will be added. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's always should be the number one thing. Absolutely. Of course, the two greatest commandment comes with that because anything that we do without love is meaningless. Mm -hmm. It's empty. If there's no love motive, you mentioned earlier, it's the heart issue. Yes, you know, um, a very religious person might say, "Well, should we use that word like magic?" But to Jesus, it's not about what word we speak or how we speak it. It's our heart condition. It's right. our motive. You know, so that's something he's teaching me. It's not the word that I use. Right. I shouldn't be so hard on myself what to say or be articulate. It's great. I think well, it's great. It's good right. in certain situations, but like to myself or to certain, you know, friends or brother and sister because the Lord doesn't, he doesn't judge right. us by the word that we say, use, right? It's in the situations, circumstances. But also when you mentioned about the gift, it's like when you go, when the Lord sends you out to those places, in the Bible he said that we also count the cost. I don't know you remember that verse. I that do. Just really I understand came that to verse mind. very intimately, yes. yes. So we start off with, can you say out of your mouth that Jesus is God? Jesus. Because no one can say it without being compelled from the, the no one can say it without being compelled by the Holy Spirit. Yes. That's dangerous. It's a it's a shortcut. You can get anybody to say anything when else. She had me say, well, right. "Of course, Jesus That's why, is God." Yes, when we first he said, "Yes, is God for sure." <laughs> Have to say it because Amen. no no one who is who is not a believer can say it. It's just impossible. Mm. And when people start realizing this, they might freak out. And then the second thing is, are you winning people over to Christ? Because part of my job as El Hombre Gris is to talk to native cultures, to original peoples. Do you even know that some people prefer to be called natives, some people prefer to be called indigenous, and some people prefer to be called original? Mm. Do you even know who the Jorobo natives were, or the, mm. the Jorobo Indians were? Do you know who Chief Osceola is? You know, are you seeking these people out? Because if you're not, Listen, I don't have to use the word magic around you, but it sure helps me win them over to Christ a lot easier while I explain why their government took their own gods away from them and then gave them a God that supposedly hates them before they took God out of everything again. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you're not doing my job, please stay out of my way mm -hmm. because you're impeding my ability to love people in Christ. Mm -hmm. And if your whole hang up is diction, I want to hear Jesus as God out of your mouth first. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let's see if you're filled with the Holy Spirit because I'm not judging you, you know, but please, please do not slow me down. That is my number one delay, by the way. Mm. It is not non-believers. It is Christians mm. impeding my ability to love others for Christ. So sad. It's frustrating. It's very frustrating. Why is that? At some point, service becomes uh, pleasurable. If, so, so Jesus said, um, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Yes. Jesus is literally being filled up as he's fasting by service. Now we're far away from that. Mm -hmm. But at some point, service becomes a hobby, becomes enjoyable. Watching people come to Christ, that becomes enjoyable. It's a practice skill. So you don't just rush them to the altar. You know, like the Holy Spirit may direct you to make friends with them and hang out with an intolerable person for mm -hmm. six months. And when they finally start making those little changes that I can especially see because I see energy, when their conversation starts changing very slowly, when people that they used to disagree with, they're listening more, they're asking more questions. Mm -hmm. When you start seeing that, there's no greater pleasure. Mm -hmm. So when I have to spend extra time that I could have spent on two people instead of one person, mm -hmm. when I have to spend extra time explaining to them that God doesn't hate you, God doesn't hate you, that's frustrating. And the weird thing about reading minds is the most common thing for non-believers is not, I hate God. It's God hates me. Mm -hmm. That's very difficult. They feel rejected. It's very difficult, yeah. yeah. They feel, they feel that, unloved. Yeah, right. They feel that rejection of... of they, f they feel hated 
by God for the way that God's people treat him, or treat them. So we have the beggars and the crippled and the lame coming into the Last Supper, and you guys are getting kicked out because I am trying desperately to explain to them that they're okay the way they are. Yeah. I don't care if you're gay. I don't care if you had an abortion. I don't care how you identify as gender. I don't care what race you are. Yeah. We're all human. Just come inside and eat. Yeah. And here you are wasting so much time talking about why the rainbow flag ticks you off, spreading hatred on YouTube, quoting verses from the Old Testament way out of context. And so it creates this immeasurable, incalculable delay to the, to the kingdom of God when most of my time is spent saying, God doesn't hate you. Yeah. And I remember as part of this journey, God would just have me walk around. I was walking five or 10 miles a day. And now I run, you know, I run a lot in exercise, <laughs> but, and I would just, I would think God hates me. And I was like, no, he doesn't. I know he doesn't hate me. And I realized that God was showing you what other people think. He was teaching me how to read minds for Christ, right? Yeah. Um, and then he says, this is how most people feel. Mm. This is what my people have done to them. This is what most people think. Whenever something bad happens to them, this is how people feel. Mm. And here's why. And so processing this over months and going, the church is effed up. Like, I don't know another word for it. Mm. It's so messed up when, when, when we have non-believers walking around all day long Asking God, God, why do you hate me? Mm. God, why do you hate me? If they're spending all their time thinking that, they don't have a lot of time to get to know God. Yeah. We've done that, so the church will be judged first. So I see a Church in the Sun. It's right across the street from Winner's Chapel International. Now, Church in the Sun believes that Jesus is God. Winner's Chapel International is a notorious cult. And I go, have your pastors met each other? So I walk to Winner's Chapel International, and I walk to Church in the Sun, and I said the same thing. They hadn't even met each other. And if Winner's Chapel International is a cult, then why aren't people from Church in the Sun going and just observing and filling that place with light? Yeah. And then there are churches that believe that Jesus is God, but they're not even talking. Do you have any idea how many churches are in a city? Yet we have people who are, you know, they need food or they need resources. Okay, well, 10 churches handle food. Five churches handle getting them set up with ID. Five ch churches handle food stamp applications. Five churches handle... If you can do a sandwich on, like, Wednesday morning... And every other church does the tiniest little thing. We'd be done with homelessness. So yes, it's a leadership issue, obviously, on the state level, federal level, municipal level. But also, we're the church. We're not supposed to wait on them. It's yeah. not illegal to feed people. Actually, here it's illegal to feed more than 20 people without a permit because, yeah, that's ungodly. But, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, what are you waiting on? What are you waiting on? What can you do? We don't have enough resources. Well, what can you do? Because a loaf of bread is like one twenty-five, and bologna is like $1.18. So what can you do? Can you put out one bed? No. Okay. Do you have any clothing to donate? No. Can you make a sandwich? Can you help one person get their ID? Do you have an ID day? Once all these churches start doing this, can you, can you be a clearing center? Can one church send people to these other churches with a bus pass? Do you have $10 in tithe money that you can buy? five one-way tickets, like what are you really doing with your time? Go buy a homeless person a cup of coffee. Do you pass them and give them a cigarette? Because maybe they're coming down from a drug addiction. Mm. Maybe the Holy Spirit will use that cigarette to get them off a drug addiction. Mm. Like what are you really doing for the kingdom of God? That's, that's where it's at. So many churches, not enough Jesus. Mm. That's what the devil wants. Yeah, now, I, know a lot of, I know a lot of pastors who are great people. I, I have personal friends. Um, Joanne and Travis Alvarez, they've been instrumental in my life, and they're great servants of Jesus, and they're always under attack from the devil, and they're doing their best. And, you know, I can see that even them being slowed down by what they're dealing with, mm -hmm. you know, and they've got kids who go to their church, and they're trying to turn them on to, to who God is, and it's just so hard. It's just so hard when you're doing your best, but we're waiting on everybody else, you know. If we all did a little, the burden would be very light. Right. Your walk with the Lord, you fully surrendered to Him since the pandemic. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, like, be, yeah. Fully surrendered is in naked in a cell with no clothing and no food, down to 148 pounds. Here in Orlando, actually. Yeah, here in Orlando, 130 days in isolation, in jail, a case of mistaken identity. Mm -hmm. But um, when I say fully surrendered and God goes, are you sure? I go, yeah, I just want Jesus. 
four hours completely naked in a holding cell, mm. down to 148 pounds measured by a nurse, mm. watching demons flow in and out of that place. I have seen them give a drink with aspartame but no sugar to a diabetic after taking their blood. And I said, hey, that has aspartame in it. And they go, I know, it's the same as sugar. And God said, they've ex exchanged the truth of God for a lie. That's what I'm showing you. So when I say I've given up everything, I mean family. Mm -hmm. My family hates me. You know, my ex-wife hates me. Won't let me see my daughter or my dog. You know, are you willing to be rejected by everything and everyone except for Jesus and just know that all you have is Jesus? Because yeah. if you're willing to do that, then great, you get the requisite responsibility. Luckily for most people, the suffering is not that intense. I have a higher calling, so it's been very intense. Yeah. But when I say sold out for Jesus, I'm talking 116, I'm talking all the way, I'm talking don't talk to me about the divisive stuff. Yeah. You know, I'm talking, let's get back to the basics. Jesus is God, he's Amen. so amazing. Amen. He's, he's, you know, everything. This, so when you walk around, do you see Jesus everywhere? Because I do. It, the whole universe speaks to him. Yeah. You don't always have to say his name. Now, this is a more Christian uh, slanted channel, so I'm saying it a lot. But can they tell by your actions who yeah. you are? You know, can you tell by the universe who he is? When you see a tree just randomly growing, you know, or whatever your thing is. Maybe you like to surf. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you see God in the waves? Yeah. Or do you, you know, and you don't even need to consciously praise him, but you probably are, you know. Just enjoying the day. Yeah. Have you ever thought that that might be praise? That our entire life can be praise and worship? Mm -hmm. That our light extends even when we're sleeping? Mm -hmm. Because we're a reflection of God. We're a reflection of Jesus. So that's where I want to be. I want to be constantly 24-7 working. Like working in my dreams. Yeah. You know, and then when I'm ready to enter into that rest, which is coming up soon, mm -hmm. uh, then I just want to enjoy the experience that he's created for us. What because do you mean coming to that rest coming up soon for you? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 <laughs> so, so he's our father, right? And, and yeah. we work a lot and yes. I've, I've worked a lot to serve him. And uh, eventually you enter into that rest, yes. as Jesus has said. Why can't you enter right now? It's not my time. You have to work. <laughs> I mean, you're not that. I, I have a higher calling, so I, I work a okay. lot. But, um, so, but he's our father. He created like a theme park for us yeah. called Earth, you know. At some point, you get to enjoy that with the joy that comes with the Holy Spirit. And that's, that's going back to what we said. If you, if you have everything, but you don't have, you know, what does it gain to, uh, what, does it, what, does it, uh, what does it benefit me to gain the whole world? Oh, lose your own soul. Yeah, all of hell is coming down on me right now because yeah. I'm telling the truth, by the way. But um, it's tough doing the right thing. But uh, so if, if you have the whole world, but you don't have God, you're going to be miserable. Mm -hmm. So... Once you get done with your work, knowing that Jesus is God, knowing that you're not, accepting Christ as your Savior, and then, um, and then you get to enjoy earth. Right. You know, money eventually doesn't become a thing. Don't worry. God will take care of that for you. Amen. Food, don't worry about it. Place to stay, don't worry about it. How much faith do you have? Good, I'll give you more, says God. You know, just ask for it. Ask for faith and wisdom, and I'll hand it to you. Amen. And then we get to enjoy the theme park. Hmm. There's nothing better. So it's a difference between earth being hell on earth in a very literal way. Yes. And a theme park. Yes. As you were sharing, just uh, one word that the, I have an impression in my heart is um, Jesus also um, mentioned in the Bible, said that repentance. When we come to him, we must come with a repentance heart. Right? We must acknowledge that we are sinners because if we don't repent, I mean, he, the law is for the proud, for the boasters. But the good news is for the humble. That's exactly it. And they take it out of context. So what does that mean, repentance? God, I'm not good enough. I'm not God. You are. I'm not sufficient to pay my sin price, obviously. Obviously. But you are God. That's repentance. Not re <laughs> like the idea that we have to continue to follow this law. That's, that's the sin. It's, I can be made justified in God's eyes or more justified than you if I just follow more of God's law. Yeah. If I just read a little more into the Bible, if I understand a little more doctrine, I can be a little more righteous than you and then I can tell you what to do. Very, very Pharisees and Sadducees. Yes. That's, that's what it was. Yeah. So true repentance is not, I can be justified by the law and I'm going to keep every commandment, God. No. True repentance is, I am so screwed up, man. Yeah. Like, God, I can't do it. Yeah. It's impossible for me. I'm yeah. a sinner. Yeah. Somehow you still love me. 
So I'm not even going to try. I'm not going to try to stop smoking. I'm not going to try to stop drinking. I'm not going to try to stop doing heroin. I'm not going to try to stop doing cocaine. I'm not going to try to stop, uh, you know, I don't know, doing this sexual thing that you think I don't, that I think you don't like. I'm not going to try to stop these kinks. I'm not going to try uh, to drive slower. I am literally going to put myself on autopilot. The only thing I know is that you are God, I'm not, and I need you. Because mm -hmm. I cannot. I failed to change these things. And then you watch it naturally happen. Mm -hmm. It will happen without any effort. You will stop drinking or you will drink in moderation. You will stop smoking or you will smoke in moderation. Your sex life will return to very normal or whatever normal is for you at the time. Uh, you will, you know, you'll be content. All of those things will naturally, if you're, if you're forcing it at all, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will literally just chip away at those things as if they were nothing. Without any pain, without any effort, Amen. that's repentance. It's going, every time I try, I fail, and it's painful. It's like, how much do you really want to suffer? Yeah. Do you really want to suffer? My burden is light. So yeah. if you're suffering trying to stop something, it's, it's you doing it in your own effort. Just give up. Just do it. I don't know what to tell you. you know, just do it. If, if it, cocaine is your thing or heroin, okay, do it. Have you accepted Jesus? Don't worry, eventually you will stop. And that's controversial, right? Mm. That's, that's, wait a minute, are you encouraging drug addicts? Yeah, I'm telling them not to struggle in their own power because eventually Satan will get tired of it and convince them to do something less. Yeah. Because even he will serve God. Amen. So if you, if you just tell them, give up, stop beating up on yourself. Just, just, just give up, they'll do it less. And less and less and less. That's why I carry around a pack of cigarettes. I smoke like a chimney. Because number one, I absorb a lot of energy, especially on the first of the month. I feel all that energy, like uh, they're they're just like I feel the itches, right? Uh, like I've never done heroin, thank God, but I feel that itchiness, and uh, and I'm like I need to smoke. And lately, it's been exercise and water, uh, but that's been a natural change. I don't try. I don't. Need, okay, here's 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 the thing people really want to know. I don't try to go to the gym. Yeah. At all, it yeah. just happens. I'm just running, jogging two miles to my gym instead of, you know, taking the bus or driving. And I get there and I work out. And I'm like, how did I get here? <laughs> Holy Spirit, it's on autopilot. Amen. You know, <laughs> just, you just got to put it on autopilot. Let him lead. <laughs> Let, Let him, him lead. lead. Don't try. Yeah, just yield it to him. Just yield. Yeah, just, yeah. yeah. I think that's the best way. And, you know, effortlessly, that's the word I tell people, is that it's effortless. It's effortless. You don't have to try in your own strength at all. Like, that's, none. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's so hard to convince believers is you say, you don't have to try. Well, what do you mean? Do you feel like going out tonight? Yeah, okay, what do you want to do? I don't know, get drunk? Okay, do it. Jesus is God, right? Yeah, okay, cool. I guarantee you that you are going to be a little different next week and a little different next week yeah. and a little different next week. But you're already saved. Don't worry, you're, you're saved. You're in God's hands. Mm. You know, it's effortless. Mm -hmm. You have the ability to believe that there's this all-powerful, almighty God who exists outside of infinity, who exists outside of the universe, mm -hmm. but you don't have the power to believe that he can, like, he can change you effortlessly. It doesn't mean all at once, and that's like another trick. It's of different the for everyone. Yeah. Some might be some people overnight, might be able, right. and some is a journey. Yeah, some Everyone's people different. might change something overnight, and some people... I met a guy who was a pastor who told me he stopped smoking overnight and told me that's why I should stop smoking. I said, that's interesting, because <laughs> you're very good at not smoking. That barely, apparently was an addiction. Apparently, your problem is judging people. <laughs> you know, so I, I, don't, I don't know how to, how to tell you. My calling is higher. I have a lot more stress than you do. I carry the energy of both drug addicts and drug dealers. Hmm. You know, I carry this greed... Some, uh, you know, part of being able to judge these things is to experience them. So I, I carry mm. the energy of that on the first of the people. I need to make some money and I need to spend some money. Mm -hmm. Are you dealing with that? No, you don't literally feel itchy and then like go for a jog and then smoke a cigarette right after. Okay, then please don't judge me. Yeah. You know. That's so, so you mentioned last night you couldn't sleep because the enemy trying to attack you. Mm -hmm. um, and once again, it goes back to God is in control, mm -hmm. and He allowed things to happen. Mm -hmm. Have you asked the Lord why the Lord allowed that to happen? Why the Lord allowed the enemy yeah. to attack you and not allow you to have a good night rest for today's filming? Uh, yeah, so I have, again, um, my, my tests are a little different. My calling is a little different. Um, so I understand it with wisdom, and I'm trying to figure out how to break this down to you. So I'm going to have to explain quantum time very briefly. The, the Earth was created in seven days. That's correct. We had the Big Bang, 
and then we had quarks like moving, right? And then there was the cycles that started. These are cycles. It's, it's the electrons, protons, and neutrons, or whatever, and the atoms. And then, then the, the bigger cycle is the Earth revolving around the sun, and the moon revolving. These are cycles. Some cycles are very beneficial. Love. If you tell your significant other, I love you every day in the morning, man, that's a great cycle. Some things are not beneficial. Um, I can use them as negotiating conditions, and God helps me to do that. So my day is, is packed. I might be called to go somewhere and talk to someone, or I might be called to do nothing. Um, but these are negotiating conditions with the universe. So let's say I'm going to meet, and my job is to connect the dots in a way. So let's say I'm, you know, I'm going to meet a person who's um, so a drug addict and a person who exercises too much. Okay, well, how do I connect the dots so that at some point in space and time they could eventually meet with each other, given they both believe in Jesus? Or how could they both cause their walk to, you know, to, to more closely get, like, get closer to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Now, I can see these things. So this is, this is alone a lot of pressure. It's how does this random person who doesn't know this random person mm -hmm. connect to each other in a way or interact in their society or, or affect other people that interact in their society in such a way that these people will most likely come to Jesus? Mm -hmm. Luckily, this is why you have the Holy Spirit, because this Amen. is impossible without God. Amen. Um, so my job might be to exercise a little less and to smoke a little more. Now, that seems like a lot of sin, man, but it's not. I'm negotiating for those two. Mm. So this is work that I might do. And then once there are sufficient workers or once there is enough of an established cycle, because people will follow in my footsteps as I follow in Jesus and hopefully stop following me and follow Jesus. Right, yeah. Um, uh, then the work gets easier. So mm. I might smoke a lot less. And eventually my goal is to be on five cigarettes a day, which is great. So if my sleep, even my sleep is a negotiating condition, mm. then there might be people who don't sleep at all. Mm. Or they might be night shift. They might be sleeping in the mm. day. So I might have to understand and be affected by their cycles in order to influence them, to kind of push them toward Christ. Interesting. And there are other people like me who connect these dots, but the harvest is plenty, but the workers are few. Wow. Especially with my level of, uh, you know, thank you God, my level of ability to see and understand these things and to just go when I'm called. Right. You know, and sometimes I don't understand them. A lot of times I don't, more right. often than not, but I still go when I'm called. Amen. So if I'm thinking all night, you know, and I finally fall asleep and then I wake up and I'm doubting God, I know it's not me. I know to keep my mouth shut. And I know the first thing out of my mouth needs to be, thank you, Jesus. Because I know they are coming down hard on me. Because mm. they're worried about this interview. Mm. They're worried I'm going to tell the truth, mm. especially about the church. Because right now, the biggest weapon of Satan that he can use is the church. It's the, the institution of the division church. Division right. in the division. church. Right. It's, it's, it's using... Legalism, right? This is going to sound... Yeah, it's legal. It's Satan using the church to attack people who otherwise would have come to Christ. Mm. That is his biggest trick. It was the biggest trick back when Jesus was alive. It's mm -hmm. the biggest trick now. Yeah. So amazing. I mean, it's interesting how that's why God said, I am still in control. Mm -hmm. The doors I open, no one can shut, and the door I shut, no one can open. Mm -hmm. So he's still in control, and he called you to this calling. He assigned this is your calling, your gift by his grace. And so he knows your heart. He, he asks you, you fully surrender. Mm -hmm. and now he's taking you two places to serve him. Yeah, this is, the part where service, this is the part where service becomes fun. This yeah. is the part um, where I get to share my joy uh, and, and how much I'm in love with Jesus in ways. And just so you know, one of the coolest things that I get to negotiate or ask for is how do I share Jesus in the most agreeable and approachable way that yeah. wins the most people over to Christ? So with time, I get better at sharing the gospel. And that's cool. That's amazing. And one of the coolest things is how do you explain that God loves us yeah. without directly saying, you need Jesus, you know, salvation or damnation. How do you, how do, you do that? You just share God, <laughs> you know. Maybe it's just with your light. Maybe it's with how you treat people. Maybe it's by holding the door. Yeah. Maybe it's by learning people's names at the places you go regularly. Yeah. But with time, you get, you get better and better in that. And that's cool. When, when showing the love of Christ, and, and you know, this sounds like it's not humble, and I don't know how to explain this in a way that, People agree with, and I really don't care because I'm sold out. But, uh, you know, l loving Christ and then finding pleasure in sharing that love of Christ. Amen. That's like, that's cloud nine. That's the best. That's heaven on earth. I agree with you. I'm in agreement with you on that so many level. 
That is so true. If we say we love him, mm -hmm. and then we don't find pleasure in loving our neighbors or our brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. whether believers or non-believers, then yep. what is, is that really true love? Mm -mm. No. Right. No. And when you have, yeah. you know, and you get better and better at loving yeah. Christ. But when you love God fully, you can get along with anybody. Amen. You can have a conversation about anything. Yeah. And it's not always about Jesus. Sometimes, like yeah. I said, it's about a hobby. Sometimes that wins them over. Yeah. Sometimes you're not supposed to win them over that day. God's going to send somebody else. Yeah. Sometimes you're supposed to hang out with them. You know, it's interesting because I, you know, I just, I turned five a few months ago in Christ. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> um, and when I first uh, came to the Lord, when I first, when he first saved me, because the three years he put me at home and he trained me and he teach me and so many things. But, and I, I was like, how could a believer, how could any believer would, go through troubles. I see everyone just so beautiful. Like I'm thinking like everything's so positive and beautiful. Yeah. How could like Christians, doesn't matter, great. right? How could this, right? Yeah. Um, but now I, like God is actually allowing me through to experience more and also to meet more brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. And I am guilty at times. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry for even say something I might not say to that person, but in my heart, God will convict me that I shouldn't think like that or I shouldn't doubt um, about a, a, a person, or especially a, a brother or sister in Christ. So Holy Spirit, He's amazing because He knows our heart. You know, we might not say things out, but He judges the heart. Right. And He will correct us mm -hmm. when we sin against Him. And I, I believe that's so amazing because then also repentance, mm -hmm. it's, it's in the heart. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I'm learning and he's teaching me, you know. Well, there are so many moving parts yeah. <laughs> that we don't control. Yeah. So uh, let's say I get on, uh, say on a train, I'm going somewhere, and I say something that could be considered rude to someone else. And I'm known around town as a guy who believes in Jesus. Maybe that person needed to hear that in order to take their focus away from me and mm -hmm. toward Jesus. And maybe I needed to do that in order to feel bad about it and learn some humility. Mm -hmm. And maybe a third party needed to hear it in order to decide not to judge. So there's all these moving parts and we just assume that there's nothing going on in the background. But there are no mistakes, there are no errors, there are mm -hmm. no coincidences. So, it, you know, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Yeah. There's no reason to have guilt. Yeah. And that's really our biggest problem as a, as a body, whether you are church leadership or you don't even attend a service. It's yeah. this guilt. Because yeah. if Satan can keep you beaten down with guilt, yeah. what else do you have time for? Mm. That's, that's the main uh, strategy of Satan is to get, to get people distracted and take them away from being, fix their eyes on Jesus. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's distraction. Distraction. What is your message you want to share in this testimony? Uh, okay, so I'm going to do, I guess I'm going to do a couple. Yes. So the first one is God, God is relatable. He's human. Ask him questions. Like, what's your favorite soda? Or what, what would it have been? You know, what, what's your favorite theme park? Stuff like that. Uh, and the second thing is, if you are considering experimenting with energy work of any kind, even the more destructive for, forms like witchcraft and voodoo and all this stuff, Please understand that you are going to destroy your life. Mm. There is a cost to that on a very real energetic level. And you can tax your life away worse than a non-believer. So if you are thinking about um, trying to pass these tests on your own that I'm talking about without being called by Christ, please do not. Please do not. Because we are called as people who understand that world, as people who have greater gifts of the Holy Spirit, we are called to a much higher level of suffering. And if you were not called to that and you try to dive into that world, even just to train a dog, you can suffer immeasurably. This can become your hell on earth. Mm. This can become a fate worse than death. Mm. This, can be, this can be a thing where you live 80 or 100 years and you can never escape the prison of your own mind. Mm. So if you are an energy worker, Make sure you have Jesus. And if you are in Reiki, make sure you have Jesus. Mm -hmm. Make sure you know Jesus is God. And if you are considering any form of witchcraft or any form of, of like that paganism or that, I forgot what it's called, but um, Wicca, know that your life's going to be hell. Mm -hmm. And it's, we're coming to a time 
where your life will be hell faster. So be careful. Don't try this at home, basically. <laughs> As a warning from the Holy Spirit speaking through me. Before witchcraft, believers? Which, yeah, witchcraft is real. It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. It is bad. It is the misappropriation of power from the throne of God. Are there believers doing these sort of things? We understand it. Uh, we don't do witchcraft, obviously. That would be a sin. But we understand it and what they're going through and how to get them out of it. Mm. Well, how to be used by the Holy Spirit to get them right. out of it. Right. We can't, even if you're, you know, even if you're on the physical level, just the regular physical level, we can't pull what them out. What about yoga? People, question, I see people question, questions <sighs> doing yoga. Come on. Can you, can you do yoga? Can you do, can you do like a vinyasa and say Jesus is God? I don't know. Can you do downward dog and still know Jesus is God? Like, come on. How far do you really want to take this? Is Pilates bad? If I go to the gym, it, like, you know, how, how far do you want to take this? Coffee's <laughs> well, I, a drug, I, I, so I know. I'm I, not talking, how, it's, coffee's a drug, right? It's caffeine. It changes the way you think. It accelerates your thinking. Uh, having too much coffee can literally kill you, but marijuana cannot. Marijuana can't kill you. Coffee can kill you. So, I, like, how far do you really want to judge? Is yoga a sin? I, not necessarily. Do you know Jesus is God? Are you doing it to make yourself more peaceful? Um, you know, at any time in your mind, do you go, I don't know, well, maybe those Indian gods, maybe they were God. <laughs> if you do that, then yeah, you've got a problem. But if you're like, Jesus is pretty awesome, before and after the class, then yeah. you're fine. Yeah. You know, don't, don't let crap divide you. You know, it's, yeah. it's like me getting on an ab machine instead of doing sit-ups and somebody going, oh, that guy's ungodly. You're like, what are you talking about, man? It makes no sense. <laughs> It's just like it's, it's so just crazy. personal preference, right? Right, yeah. And at the end is the heart mm -hmm. issue. Right. You can meditate even. You yeah. can meditate. You know, you're meditating knowing that Jesus is God. Yeah. Meditate on his word. Yeah. You know, you can breathe. That's something that the devil sometimes takes away from us. He can get you anxious, you yeah. know. He can get you distracted from God. Yeah. So does yoga help you to learn to breathe? Mm. Does it help you to get closer to God? Then it's not a sin. At the same time, Paul instructs us, if somebody feels affected, but not if they tell you yoga's bad, but if they go, I'm not going to yoga with you because I feel like God doesn't want me to do it, cool, don't invite them. Yeah. You know, if they feel like eating bacon in front of you makes you less godly, cool, don't do it. Yeah. But when you're on your own, please have that double bacon cheeseburger, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, just enjoy life. <laughs>